Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm honoured to, to speak from a perspective of the pilgrim. Just to really put it into context, um, I need to give you a little bit of background, uh, which I'll explain why. Uh, born in Pakistan, come to UK at the age of nine, Muslim by birth, belief, and educated in the UK system, did medicine, then microbiology, for the sins of which I'm standing here, um, then went into medical management, and then uh, became a non-executive director in medical protection society. Um, as a Muslim, Hajj is a compulsory duty. And uh, it was an amazing thing uh, for me and my family that uh, I went to Hajj with my daughter and son-in-law. This was about six, seven years ago. So things have changed. So please remember that is in that perspective that I'm talking to you about my experience. I'm also talking to you about my experience as a believer, but with the objectivity of an education in the UK. Uh, to be able, and also the medical background, to be able to see things and check um, to say it isn't something that I just accept. So, in that context, <coughs> the preparation for Hajj in the UK is very well organised in the sense that you have your set immunisations, you have travel agents who ensure that all your paperwork is done, your travel organisation is done, and you have various levels of whatever spend that you have. You obviously have to have the money to be able to go to Hajj. You cannot borrow the money. Uh, you have to have that savings. Uh, it's, it's one of the compulsory things. Uh, so the preparation uh, is uh, you have a meeting with the group uh, organised by your travel agent, two meetings prior to attending uh, the pilgrimage. In the meetings, uh, you have an imam, a leader, who will be part of your group, uh, who talks to you about the experience. You have to get into my mental frame of mind or mental frame of mind of Muslims because uh, I think previous uh, presenters have shown that out of all the Muslims, only a small number, proportionately, actually get to do the Hajj. I think somebody mentioned 375 years if all the Muslims are around at this time. Uh, that's how long it would take. So you feel very special very privileged and waiting for this amazing experience that you're going to have. The reality is that we're all human beings. You go with a group um, and you get to know the group. The group may have group dynamics, but they are all individual people with various expectations with various backgrounds, with various issues, all of them coming together for a total of between two to three weeks, but key five days uh, where you are so close that you know the other person. And in all this time, you have to be on your 100%, if not 1,000% best behaviour. You have to say your prayers on time. You have to do all the ritual procedures. You cannot, cannot lose your temper at anything. You have to be tolerant of everybody's behavior, no matter how, what you might think under normal circumstances that you wouldn't even bother with them. All these things, are amount to self-discipline, enormous amount of self-discipline. 
in the preparation, you, this is talked about, um, but the experience in itself is very, very different, as expected. Um, and as a medical person, I saw people who had really some very severe personal traumatic mental health issues. Somebody was coming for the tenth time to do Hajj because it gave her solace because she had lost a young child. Another person came to Hajj because they, uh, you know, they just had various other mental health issues. There was, a, there was somebody who came in, when she walked in, she was physically fit. By the time that we actually got to Minna, she was completely incapacitated. She couldn't move. She had put 20 layers of clothing on in that heat. There was obviously some issue. Um, and it's, you're dealing with these sorts of people. You're dealing with people with that level. Of, obviously, I'm not saying everybody's like that, but at the end of the day, people come with various motivations, and it's important to remember that. Um, and the expectations, when we're talking about how to improve things, you have to see where the ground root is. It isn't just people coming for a religious belief and that's it. There is lots and lots of undercurrent and issues which human beings have that brings to, the, to that stage. The important things that I think that we need to consider from the UK base about consideration for improvement. Number one, I would say that the travel agents ought to be accredited. They should be accredited to a standard that they provide a service, to a level that is expected. Uh, I'm not sure there is an accreditation system, because certainly some of the experiences we had with what was advertised and given was completely different. The second thing is that each group does have a medical representative. That medical representative needs to be qualified to be able to do with acute medical emergencies, primary care emergencies, because they're a majority of those. Yes, we have a medical representative with us, however, they were too busy carrying out the rituals themselves, so completely inaccessible when some poor woman twisted her ankle and was lying in bed, nobody could deal with her. When somebody else had needed some cough, cold, developed some chest infections, again, not available. Um, all these things need to be considered. We are actually leaders in this area, and we should be providing that sort of leadership to other countries. There were many other countries, and you can see that each country has actually got a systematic approach. Thank you systematic approach for dealing with their own communities. There is another learning that we could do from there, which is what is best practice? Because certainly some countries were much more organized than others. I will leave you with these thoughts. Thank you very much.